here we go again. Here are 19 reasons to watch the Carrie remake from 2013. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Dave Wilson at Dave Wilson on Instagram, and this is the place where I talk to you about all things Stephen King. There's a link to the description to my range of Stephen King themed band shirts, my own collection of short stories, once more around the sun, my newsletter, and a bunch of other stuff. But most of all, thank you so much for checking out this video. I hope you enjoy it, and if you do, maybe consider subscribing afterwards if you've not done so already. So as you know by now, we're talking about Carrie again. Yet, yeah, it seems as though the De Palma original from 1976 wasn't enough. Neither was the Rage Carrie 2, or the 2002 Made for TV remake. Nope, we're up to 2013, where they went back for more, Julianne Moore in many ways, and did another Carrie remake. So this one stars Julianne Moore, it stars Chloe Grace Moretz, it stars Judy Greer, it was directed by Kimberly Pierce, and it's the focus of this video today. I'm going to give you 19 reasons to watch it, and anything that might spoil a first time watch, I will cluster behind the spoiler alert, so you can dodge that if you need to, you can simply find the timestamp in the description for the outro, and skip ahead and see me there. Now if you want to watch this one, this is available to buy or rent in a bunch of places online, so you really will have no difficulty tracking it down. Okay then, let's do it one more time, here are 19 reasons to watch the 2013 remake of Carrie. Right, this is where I offer you my headline takeaway reason, and for this one, it's difficult. Why is it difficult? Well, come on, honestly, who needed this? Hands up, yeah, nobody. Like, on paper, on paper, I can see sort of the appeal. Updating the story for modern times and bringing in Julianne Moore as the unhinged Margaret White. But they barely do the former, and they severely hamstring the latter. And the result is just this glossy remake of an absolute classic that has none of anything that made that absolute classic original feel special. So what's really interesting is actually digging into the lost or deleted scenes from this one. And when you look at that stuff, it does appear that Kimberly Pierce wanted to do something different from De Palma's version. And it was perhaps the studio execs who cut it up to make it more of a life for like remake. But among those deleted scenes, and we see a hint of this in the trailer actually, there's suggestion that more of the white committee was going to be used as a framing or narrative device. We get a different opening. Now, I love the opening for this film. I think it's one of its strongest points. But there was also an opening where we get young Carrie talking to her teenage next door neighbour. Margaret White comes out, gets in a huff about boobs, and Carrie makes stones hail down on the house so that would have been great i would have really liked to have seen that and there's an alternative ending too but i'll get to that after the spoilers what's most surprising here and it's perhaps actually a reason to watch this film is that for a story that is so bonded by blood this movie is so bloodless and the blood we do get is basically all cgi and it looks terrible like guys if you're doing blood do practical effects. Even I managed to do that in my crappy music video. His man in black keeps coming back again, wanting to take your hand. So I wanted to talk about the modernising of this film with this 2013 version. Now, basically what it comes down to is you know the famous scene in the shower when Carrie gets her period and is mocked by all of her classmates in this version Chris Harkinson whips out her phone films it and then pops it onto YouTube for the whole world to see and that's interesting that's an interesting take but that's about as much as they do and it's not as effective as I think they hoped it would be because Carrie is not online she's not connected she doesn't have a phone so if they were trying to do some sort of cyberbullying angle, it really didn't work. Now, had they made Carrie a little bit more plugged into the modern world, and so she was seeing this pop up on her own feeds that might be normally really biblical in nature, that could have been something interesting. But honestly, you take that scene with the phone out and you'd never know that this was supposed to be set right now. It could have easily just been another one set in the 70s. So when this one got announced back in 2011, there were 
plenty of big questions from some big names with ties to the Cary name. I'm going to read out some quotes that I found about this, starting with what Stephen King had to say. So he remarked, the real question is why, when the original was so good. And he also suggested Lindsay Lohan for the main role and stated that the film would certainly be fun to cast. And then after that, Sissy Spacek, of course, played Carrie in the original. She was all in favour of Lindsay Lohan being Carrie White, saying, oh my God, she's a really beautiful girl. And so I was flattered that they were casting someone to look like me instead of the real Carrie described in the book. It's going to be real interesting. And then Jonathan Glickman, who was president of MGM's field division, said that two reasons to do the re remake were the advances in special effects since the 1976 film and the prevalence of bullying as a national crisis. And of course, none of this actually happened. Lindsay Lohan as Carrie would have been a disaster in 2011. The special effects look terrible and the bullying is just the same. This is one scene with a phone. There is another red flag on this one. The director did say in an, interview, in an interview that she perceived this as a superhero origin story. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's spend a couple of reasons looking at the cast. So Chloe Grace Moretz is actually pretty good as Carrie, but she doesn't feel weird enough or enough of an outsider. Like, you look at our previous Carries, Sissy Spacek and Angela Bettis, they are both outsiders. Not so here. Chloe Grace Moretz is basically just like your classic teen movie stealth hot girl. You know, she takes the glasses off, she becomes super hot. In this case, she takes the frumpy clothing off and puts her prom dress on and suddenly she's beautiful. Like, I actually would have rather seen her as one of the bullies. So Julianne Moore as Margaret White is good, but she feels blunted and underused. Like the scene where she's scratching her leg with her little semen picker, that's great, that's dark. That's what I wanted more of, but I feel like she was pretty hard done by in the end. Now, I can't be bothered to cover anyone else in more detail apart from Portia Doubleday, who played Chris Harginson. Quite possibly my favourite Chris Harginson of the three we've had. And she's just really nasty, really hums it up, and really shows that this character must be a very fun one to play. So lastly, before spoilers, I mean, this is fine in the sense that you definitely know what's going to happen. So you can plot this on and zone out and not have to think too much, which in today's world is no bad thing. But also it feels like a waste of a Stephen King movie. Like, give us something new. What did Carrie White ever do to you? Okay, from this point onwards, I'm gonna be talking about things that might ruin a first time watch. So consider this your spoiler alert. If you wanna bail here, just find the timestamp in the description to the outro and I will see you there. Otherwise, stick around because I've got a few more reasons for you to watch the 2013 remake of Carrie coming right up. So as I've already mentioned, this one potentially would have been more faithful to the book, but ended up getting moved around and just being more faithful to the original movie, which is a bit of a shame. But one thing I did like in here, a little nod to the Rage Carry 2, when we get the immediate aftermath after the Pink's Blood has been dropped and Chris's video is projected onto the big screens in the school hall, like the video usage in the Rage Carry 2. I liked that as a little nod. Okay, so let's go on to some of my more notable moments in this then. Let's start off with the not at all problematic moment of the high school teacher commenting on how one of her pupils is really dreamy. Wow, Tommy Ross? He is pretty dreamy, huh? What? Although, I did enjoy him looking like he was in Panic at the Disco when he was trying on all his different outfits. That was pretty funny. Now, the way Carrie killed Billy by stopping his car mid-air, that was pretty cool and creative. <laughs> also, Margaret silently walking across the background after Carrie has got home. That was great, really creepy. Needed more of that kind of stuff. As I've already mentioned, the opening was great, really, really dark. Margaret giving birth and then almost snuffing out baby Carrie right there and then. Like it's very bleak and it sort of sets you up with this huge amount of hope that this remake is going to be worth watching. Shame really. But my favourite moment has to be the death of Tina. First by electrocution and then by fire. Great combination. <laughs> As 
my favourite line. Well, it's right after the blood has been dropped on Carrie and we see Chris Harkinson just convulsing and shouting, freak, freak, like an absolute freak herself. It's great. Peak Chris Harkinson. Freak! Freak! So let's take a look at links to other King works. Gillian Moore was in Tales from the Dark Side, the movie would later be in Lisey's story. And Lawrence D. Cohen is a screenwriter on this. He was also the screenwriter on the original Carrie. That makes a lot of sense when you look at the similarities between the two. He also was screenwriter for the It miniseries, Tommy Knocker's miniseries, and the Dreamcatcher movie. In terms of Easter eggs, not many. I noticed that Carrie's house number was 47, which is the year King was born. And I'm pretty sure that the numbers on the license plate for Tommy's car were 217, 217. It's a 19, it's a shining. You get it. If you spotted anything else, let me know in the comments. Okay, then let's talk endings. The ending we get is just a cheap rip off of the De Palma one and is absolute yawn. But there's an alternate ending out there that you can watch on YouTube and is well worth looking up where Sue Snell is giving birth and Carrie's bloody hand pops out from under her and reaches up and grabs her arm before she wakes up having a nightmare. That's the one we should have got. Give us that one. Come on. So there we go, 19 reasons to watch this Carrie remake. Will this be the last time we talk about a Carrie movie on this channel? I mean, hopefully, but probably not, given the news recently that Mike Flanagan is going to be making a series of Carrie in 2025. So, good. I mean, it's not like we don't have any adaptations in this already, is it? Anyway, let me know what you think of this one. Where does it rank for you among the other Carrie movies? It's bottom of the list for me. Mine would probably be De Palma, The Rage Carry 2, 2002, and then this one, considerably lower down. But let me know what you think. And while you're doing stuff, check out my Stephen King band shirts, check out my collection of short stories, Once More on the Sun, sign up to the newsletter, subscribe to this channel, all of those things, and do come back soon. And yeah, take care. Stay safe. They're going to laugh at you. Without